And I've always liked this one. It, it's about Frederick Douglass, uh, circa 1860. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, what he finishes saying is to suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the right of the hearer as well as the speaker. And I went, uh, I went to law school specifically to do First Amendment law. Um, I was kind of one of the, it, it was considered actually pretty weird to show up in law school and to, to specifically want to just do First Amendment law. Um, <coughs> I, got, I got definitely somewhat uh, looked at kind of funny for that. It, it, it's a um, sort of a hyper-specializing uh, hyper on something like that. You know, first of all, people would say, well, there's no money in doing that, and how are you going to find a job doing that? But this is uh, why I went to law school. and. The, but nonetheless, the kind of cases that I deal with on campus um, over the last 11 years, uh, even though I worked for the ACLU of Northern California, even though I was very well versed in the history of freedom of speech, I was not prepared for the kind of ridiculous nonsense I would be seeing on college campuses. Um, and it's something that, and I, you know, then that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Um, I needed to put all the, uh, well not all, but actually this is only a tiny percentage of the cases I've seen over the years, and I wanted to put them in one place. So people could understand um, just how far off track we've gotten. Now I'm going to be t if you if, how, how many of you have actually already read the book? Oh wow, okay. I, I, I usually give the speech assuming people haven't uh, that haven't read the book. So I'm going to be covering some uh, some ground that you, 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 you've already heard. Um, but one thing that I, I, I mentioned in the book, but I really have to emphasize, as crazy as the cases are. Um, the scarier part of it generally is that faculty and students don't care. Um, that when these cases happen, when someone is kicked out of school for a collage, um, as bad as that case is, and I'm going to be talking about that in a minute, the much worse thing is not a single faculty member, not a single student grows to that student's defense. That would be considered a horrifying, shameful thing only a couple of decades ago. But meanwhile, what I deal with on campuses is that this is sort of taken for granted. <clears throat> and also, you know, as a student of the history of freedom of speech, the real uh, and the philosophy behind it, I'm always amazed at the sort of thin understanding that I think is is given to the entire wonderful anarchical system of freedom of speech that that um. Uh, uh, that, that kind of arose out of the other great anarchical systems of the uh, of the Enlightenment period, um, and people who critique it these days on campuses seem to do so without really understanding how much th this uh, wonderful epistemological system has actually uh, given us. And they only uh, they only emphasize the, the the those one or two moments when someone says something we hate, as opposed to the million times a day that you're actually deeply benefiting from this grand philosophy. The, the ability to engage in thought experiments, to engage in devil's advocacy, makes us better thinkers. And when you create an environment where people can't do that, can't do that safely, um, honestly, I, I think the long-term effect is it hurts our, our, our ability to reason with each other and our ability to see each other uh, uh, clearly or accurately. So, so um, one thing that really chilled me when I was working on the book was uh, <laughs> the, first, the first book that was written about this was called The Shadow University. Not, but, I mean, the first real sort of uh, ambitious epic tome about this, this kind of censorship on campus, um, and which came out in 1998. And it talks about early incidents of sort of uh, what could be roughly called, um, and uh, it's a uh, political correctness run amok on college campuses. Um, and, but one thing that you guys have to understand, particularly your generation needs to understand, is that when speech codes first started appearing on college campuses, it, um, uh, Rush Limbaugh and Gary Trudeau, uh, the, the Washington Times and the New York Times all agreed that these things were a scandal, that they had no place on college campuses. Um, meanwhile, there are more speech codes on college campuses than there ever were in the 80s and 90s. But again, we've gotten used to them and nobody seems to care. I think that this is part and parcel, though, of, of part of the problem with the culture wars, because one thing that I find endlessly frustrating, too, is that when people uh, are concerned about some of these issues, they seem to oftentimes only care if uh, it's happening to someone who reflects their existing politics. It's, it's a symptom of, of the culture war that, uh, that I've seen this take place, where people go, yes, but how does this affect me? Instead of thinking about how, how is this affecting everybody. And so, uh, um, I want to set out and uh, make the argument that um, the possibility of getting in trouble on campus is affecting the way we talk to each other. Um, and I refer to this um, uh, study in the book, but I wanted, wanted you guys to see it for, your, 
uh, see the graph for yourself. And this is a study by the American Association of College and Universities. They asked 24,000 students this milk toast question, is it safe to hold unpopular uh, positions on college campuses? That's the kind of question you ask to be a whitewash. That's the question that you go to your 24,000 students and you're like, of course it's safe to hold unpopular points of view on campus. Um, if you wanted a real answer to that, you'd say, do you feel totally safe expressing, um, uh, to ma making any argument? Just asking if it's safe to hold, you should expect to have 100% strongly agree, of course it's safe to hold if I don't tell anybody what my opinions are, because it should be literally true. Nonetheless, even attempting this whitewashy question, um, only 40% of freshmen um, strongly agreed with the statement that it's safe to hold unpopular points of view on campus. Only 40%. Uh, and if you, and if, you, if you sort of think it might kind of uh, be okay to hold uh, popular positions on campus, that means you don't. <laughs> but look at, the, look at the trajectory. From freshman year to senior year, it goes from 40% to 30%. Uh, with, and with each and each year, students get less and less confident that it's safe to merely hold unpopular points of view on campus. And this is the most telling one of all. They asked 9,000 campus professionals this question. Only 18.7% of them answered that, uh, that, that they strongly agreed that it's safe to merely hold unpopular points of view on campus. And of that, only 16.7% of college professors strongly agreed with the statement. This to me is just absolutely an indictment. And again, it was done in a manner that seemed clear that they were trying to actually you know, gloss over this as being a problem. There were two other things that I think come directly out of the atmosphere we've created for um, uh, free speech and discourse on college campuses. And those include uh, what the, the so-called uh, silent classroom phenomenon. Um, I've read you know, books and articles about this for years. Um, and it's a lot of hand-wringing, in some cases by sociologists, trying to figure out why is your generation and the generation before you so unwilling to talk up in class? What's happened? It used to be that the, the, the debate and discussion in class was fun and freewheeling and people were opinionated and it was great. Why are they being so quiet? And I've read so many books about this and I find it so stunning that they talk about, you know, different, different ideas that I think have some validity about, um, you know, I, conceptions of politeness, of the principle of subjectivity, all of these different things that I think make some sense, but also these kind of like harebrained kind of ideas. I remember reading in one article in the New York Times that this was due to the CNN political talk show Crossfire. Um, and they come up, uh, meanwhile, I'm dealing with students who are actually getting in trouble for having the wrong point of view in a, in a class or on campus. And it never comes up that the fact you could actually get in trouble on a college campus for saying the wrong thing would be the most effective way to produce situations where people don't bother speaking in class. Now, this is called the chilling effect. Essentially, it doesn't mean that it has to be very, very likely that you are going to get in trouble. It just has to be some amount of risk that you could get in trouble for having the wrong opinion. And that risk is real, um, unfortunately. And part of my goal is to make sure that that risk is, uh, is reduced as much as it possibly can be. Now, the other phenomenon that, I, that, that relates very closely to the book is um, this incredible study that, that I, I stumbled across in Diana Muntz's book called Hearing the Other Side, in which she compared um, the education level of students um, and the question about how many uh, political disagreements do you have in an average week? Um, and the relationship was completely inverse. If you have a high school education, you talk to the, the most people with whom you politically disagree in the course of a week. If you have a college education, you talk to fewer people with which you disagree in an average week. And by the time you get up to PhDs, you're talking to the fewest people that you disagree with. In other words, the more education you have, the thicker your echo chamber is. And if there's one thing that's, that, that, that is established in, in study after study, and in a great book called Hearing the, uh, uh, called, um, uh, it's a Cass Sunstein book, um, Going to Extremes, talking about how um, if, you, if you live in a sort of a self-confirmatory bubble, it tends to make you more extreme in your points of view, to have characterish ideas of, who, of, of what other points of view are, um, and also show that people tend to show incredibly poor understanding of where other people are coming from. And it, it's a sort of self-catalyzing uh, self -catalyzing process. Um, and uh, the, uh, and my, one of the things that, and at a certain level, you, you know, people can understand that people want to live in neighborhoods and in communities where everybody agrees. 
But the problem is that's exactly what's wrong with our entire society at the moment, um, that we are all talking to. We're all, 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 we, all, we are increasingly thickly in our echo chambers. And higher education is the one institution that could be helping push back against that. It could be saying that the habit of, a, of an educated person is to seek out the smart person they disagree with. And that used to be understood as the habit of, a, of, of an educated person. And I see less and less evidence that people value that at all today. So, but what am I, I, I have two keyboards, this is really good. Keyboard. So, but what am I talking about? Um, since you've read the book, you're familiar with the case of Hayden Barnes. Um, this is a recreation of the, uh, it's a very faithful recreation of the uh, collage you put up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, this, this is a student, um, Shambhala Buddhist, believer in non-aggression, decorated EMT, uh, environmentalist. Um, he was critical of uh, President Ronald Zachariah's decision to start up a uh, parking garage complex. Ronald Zachariah had been stopped two years before in starting up this uh, parking garage project, which he had taken to referring to as something that was part of his legacy um, after he, he, he uh, uh, would leave the university. Um, and he wasn't going to let this project be stopped again. So it's, it's a really surreal case when you look at the facts as it came out in Discovery. Um, because this, uh, when he found out, when Ronald Zachariah found out that there was a student who was opposing the parking garage through incredibly civil means. He was writing to Board of Regents, he wrote a letter to the editor, like old fashioned kind of freedom of speech. And he got called into a meeting with President Zachary, dressed down for something like an hour and a half about how dare you do this to me. But what uh, Barnes didn't know is uh, Zachary had already had a couple meetings with his uh, other advisors and other uh, higher ups in the uh, Valdosta State University administration, at, uh, trying to figure out how can I get this student kicked out. Hmm. Now, the only thing that's vaguely positive about this is at least the administrators were saying, you can't. This is a, would be a violation of constitutional due process and a violation of constitutional free speech. But nonetheless, he calls the student in the class, dresses him down, and after that, Hayden Barnes, in defiance, um, makes this collage that he puts up on Facebook. Um, no blood for oil, asthma puffer, uh, crushed earth. And when Zachariah found this, he, he, he went, to the, uh, went to the board, went to his, uh, uh, the, the people underneath him, said, aha, I've got him, and I'm going to kick this guy out unilaterally, because this is a threat on my life. Because it involved the word memorial. And the strained logic is that um, memorials usually happen after you're dead, so therefore this decorated EMT, Shambhala Buddhist, um, is trying to kill me. Um, now, what... What I worry about for your generation is there's uh, is I, the, the deference to authority is something is something that I find like really troubling sometimes. And people will bend over going like, well, but of course he, he he should immediately be afraid. This is perfectly reasonable. Now, if there's any doubt, um, I love how many clues that they they um, uh, uh, was packed in this case that showed that this guy did not think this was uh, that that Hayden Barnes was a threat to his life. And the best example of that to me is that the way that. Rob Zachary made sure that the student was kicked out was that he stapled this collage to an expulsion notice saying that Hayden Barnes was a clear and present danger on campus and you need to get off campus within 48 hours. If you think someone's going to be the next campus shooter, you don't slip a note under his door kicking him out. Um, it just and, and the thing is, he, he, he wasn't able to get anybody to, 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 to go along with that and that's why I ended up kicking the student out this way. Um, the student, by the way, is, uh, uh, went and got two psychological evaluations um, from, uh, from the campus and from a, another person that he, uh, that, that, uh, he, uh, that he got in, uh, in southern Georgia, immediately saying this, this student is a harm to no one, this harm to, 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 not a harm to himself. This guy's a hero. He's a decorated EMT. But, that, but also, again, they didn't bother with that. They kept the student kicked out. And he would have stayed kicked out completely having had his rights violated if he hadn't um, gotten one short story in a local newspaper that Fire ended up finding about. Now, this has gone through litigation. President Zachary is being held personally liable because he was put on notice several times he was violating the Constitution and that this just doesn't pass the laugh test. <laughs> uh, so, but just to give you more ideas of the kind of cases I deal with, maybe those of you who read about this one, um, this is the actual cover, Notre Dame versus the Klan. This is a book about the defeat of the Klan when they marched on Notre Dame in 1924. It celebrates the defeat of the Klan by Catholic students when, it, when they marched on, on, on Notre Dame. 
it's a euphorically anti-plan book. Um, and this just points out the irony of this case. Um, the student who was reading it, a non-traditional age student named Keith John Sampson, because this picture, which is related to the actual march on Notre Dame um, in 1924, um, uh, made another student uncomfortable, that there was no defense of it whatsoever. Um, the fact that the student had made someone uncomfortable um, meant he harassed that, uh, that student. He was now a racial harasser. And you should, you have to, you have to, you can see all of this original documentation at the FIRE website. Um, <coughs> you would think that this guy had come out as a Klan member as opposed to reading a book about the, uh, about the defeat of the Klan. But nonetheless, it took the combined effort of the ACLU, the Wall Street Journal, and FIRE to get this university to back down in this case. Just manifestly ridiculous. But when these things start taking on their, uh, their momentum, it's, it's amazing where they can end up. And then, of course, there's just the problem of overregulation, um, where, uh, and I think this has this relates to the uh, mass bureaucratization of universities. You have this uh, true, uh, this huge expansion of the administrative class at universities. And in 2006, the graph, um, the number of people involved in, in just administration, finally overtook the number of people involved in instruction at our, uh, our nation's universities. Um, and it's just kept on going in that, in that way since even with, with, with cuts, you're still having a faster expansion of, of the administrative class and to some, in some cases a, a shrinking professorate, at least certainly full-time professorate. And from that comes these kind of weird attempts to really regulate every single aspect of your lives. And the, the reason why this one is in here is because it's related to um, a case that we just settled maybe two or three weeks ago. And this was a pro-life student group they wanted to have a, uh, a, a protest on campus, but they were told that this public university had a ban on any holding any sign on campus. That you were not allowed to hold any sign. And at first they were saying, okay, so we won't have, we won't hold sticks, we'll just hold posters out. But then when they did that, they were told um, to, that they couldn't even have anything written on poster board on campus, and that it was ultimately no signage whatsoever. We wrote, and the funny thing is, we had written this university before in 2007, saying that this is laughably unconstitutional policy. This is not a close call, um, and they dismissed us. So now they're getting sued. And when we wrote them again, the university president cited Virginia Tech in 9-11. Now let that sink in for a minute, because I think this is particularly, it's funny at some level, but it's also particularly reprehensible. The, 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 Speed with which, and, I, and how many different situations I've seen where, where university administrators and presidents have dismissed, um, have, have used uh, uh, as excuses to go after incredibly tame speech. Um, the fact that they believe that if you invoke Virginia Tech or 9-11, you're able to get basically whatever you want. Um, and to me, this is despicable. Um, you, sh you should not so lightly be, be invoking such serious offenses. Meanwhile, and this is, I feel like this is part of a couple of cases, there was a case at University of Cincinnati um, at the same time, uh, which uh, ended up resulting in a court decision uh, a year before. That was a case where um, students were being <laughs> told that in order to pass out a ballot initiative, uh, to get signatures for a ballot initiative, they had to go to a free speech zone, which is worthy of the name Orwellian, that was only 0.1% of the campus. And even to use that, they had to get 10 days advance state permission in order to use it. Now, that's, uh, hopefully everybody knows that's unconstitutional. Apparently, University of Cincinnati did not. They decided to fight this tooth and nail in court, and of course they lost. Well, and what's even more galling to me is, is that, um, you know, 0.1% of campuses is amazingly unconstitutional um, behavior. But the fact that it, it's worse to me that University of Cincinnati thought this was uh, something that they could actually win in court. Um, that, and and worse, worse still is the fact that they thought this was something worth finding out in court. So, and that brings us back to the topic of speech codes. I talked about there being more now than there were in the 80s and 90s. Um, FIRE has a full-time uh, attorney um, who uh, pretty much her sole job is to look at university uh, policies to evaluate them for constitutionality. This is really the only way you can do it, because since constitutional analysis sometimes can be a little complicated, um, is you have to look at the policies individually. So um, what we found is that, uh, uh, now, and now we evaluate a good 400 colleges across the country, 
is that 62.1% of them maintain what we call red light speech codes. Uh, red light speech codes are, are ones that, uh, you know, uh, um, to put it simply, are ones that are laughably unconstitutional. As in every single time codes like this have been challenged, they get defeated in a court of law. Um, and believe it or not, 62.1% is an improvement. Uh, that when we first started doing the study, it was uh, between 79 and 75 percent of, of uh, top colleges maintain codes that are constitutional. Now, these include our speech <coughs> zones, like I was just talking about, but they also include codes um, that are just uh, cut and pasted out of other lawyers' um, uh, workbooks, essentially. A great example of this was um, at University of Connecticut. They had a policy uh, that uh, banned inappropriate jokes. And inappropriately directed laughter. <laughs> they had this as an actual policy. <laughs> and meanwhile, when this was challenged in the court of law in 1991, this was of course defeated. And the, and the thing is, I think people have gotten so used to seeing these kind of codes, they don't really think about what the plain language means. The plain language of that code means is that arguably every single person in this room could be brought up under this code. And this is why you don't want to make codes too vague or broad, because you don't want it to, be, it to, to leave it up to the administration to decide, am I going to enforce this against you or not? That's a principle enshrined in First Amendment law, and it's, um, and it's something that, uh, uh, that automatically finds most of these codes unconstitutional, because most of us have at least arguably at some point or another engaged in inappropriately directed laughter by someone's definition. But what's striking about that code is that not only was it defeated in the court of law, it was defeated in the court of public opinion, it was laughed at um, and, uh, by the public, but Drexel University decided to take the code and put, make it its code, um, uh, just take the whole thing, even though it had been defeated in the court of law, and adopt it. And, which, and it main, they maintained this code until 2007, until FIRE brought, uh, brought attention to it in 2007. So these things keep on... Uh, coming back up, uh, one of my favorite ones, my, my mom's British, so for some reason the, the vague Victorian kind of feel of this one particularly appeals to me, is a Florida Gulf Coast University had a code that simply banned expressions deemed inappropriate. Ugh. Which, just the sheer vagueness of it, and again, you're putting an administrator in charge of deciding, do you deem this expression inappropriate? <laughs> and the idea that students wouldn't immediately revolt against that to me, again, is, is somewhat scary. Now, um, this usually comes up in questions, the, the, uh, and I'm just going to address this right now. The distinction between public and private colleges. Um, private colleges, I'm uh, sorry, public colleges are bound by the First Amendment. They are bound by very strong case law. It's unambiguous. The Supreme Court has been very strong on the free speech rights of college students and professors, um, you know, arguably since the 1950s, the late 1950s, um, with a little bit of an ugly edge in the, in the first part of the 50s, but from their progress. Um, and since 1989, there have been uh, over a dozen challenges to campus speech codes. Every single one of them has been successful. Every single one of these codes, when they are challenged, every single one has been found unconstitutional. Yet, again, 62.1% of colleges maintain them. Private colleges have, uh, uh, they have freedom of association, and they're not directly bound by the First Amendment. Um, that means that if you want to have a private college that is more restrictive, than the rest of the uh, than the rest of, of, of public of the public colleges down the street, and you tell people in advance when they come, listen, this is a really restrictive college. Um, know what you're getting into when you come here. You actually do have the right to, to to set up that private college. What you don't have the right to do is to promise students one thing when they're coming in and deliver another. So the Yales and the Harvards and the Wellesleys promise free speech and academic freedom um, in glowing language. And FIRE's position is you have to deliver on those promises. And those are legally enforceable to a certain degree, uh, depending on what state you're in. Um, but, whether they're, uh, but at the same time, our argument is primarily that if you, <laughs> if, that these are policies, these promises allow you to get the best students, the best uh, faculty members, and get to, in some cases, billions of dollars in donations you have a moral obligation to live up to those promises of, 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 free, of free speech, um, uh, even on private campuses. Um, but I wanted to, since I'm up here, I wanted to uh, pick on Harvard a little bit um, and just talk about some of the uh, goofier cases we've had at Harvard. Um, this is a case in, in, involving when the, uh, at Harvard Business School, the uh, computer system crashed in the middle of interview week. Um, 
I don't know uh, about you, if you guys know business school students, but this basically meant that Harvard business school students were at a competitive disadvantage against Wharton and Stanford business school in their interviews. And if that happened at Stanford, I think they would have burned the freaking building down. Uh, <laughs> these, are not, uh, these are not shy people. But the most, um, this is the, the, the most ferocious protest the students made of the uh, of, of this you know d disaster um, for for them at, on campus, and it's a cartoon in the business uh, school magazine that has pop up windows giving all the excuses they got and politely uh, carefully in the corner it says incompetent morons. <laughs> That's the absolute meanest thing that they did in response <laughs> to the fact that that Harvard Business School nearly incompetently um, harmed their careers. And the student in this case, um, the editor of the student newspaper, not the one who wrote, who, who made this cartoon, <coughs> was hauled into the dean's office and told that he would be held responsible for anything that offended, uh, that was offensive to the administration again. So he understandably quit because he couldn't promise to actually be a journalist and not say anything that could offend the administration. And amazingly, when we wrote to the university, when we wrote to Harvard Business School, they stuck by this um, for at least a month. Um, saying that, uh, saying that we, no, it's like this was insulting to our staff, and therefore we we have every right to to stop it. And what's so convenient about this, and one of the reasons why free speech makes such sense, is that having a blanket rule um, it, it prevents people from coming up, with, and people are so good at doing this, coming up with these rationalizations that allow them to get things their own way. Now the the dean was was saying, well, this was insulting to our computer staff. It's like yes, and also it was insulting to you. Your administration blew it. You don't want people to know about this, and it's very convenient that you're coming up with a justification to keep the student newspaper from criticizing you. Um, people are incredibly skillful at coming up with justifications to punish the people who they disagree with or, or who criticize them. And it was only after we took this case public that the university backed down and said, wait, wait a second, we're, we're, we're going to allow the student newspaper to criticize Harvard, Harvard Business School. Um, fast forward to just a couple of years ago, and for whatever reason, um, and this one I just, I just find incredibly funny, um, we have free speech controversies that come out of the uh, Yale-Harvard uh, football game. Um, I didn't even know they had football teams until I saw it on The Simpsons. <laughs> and this year, they, they went with, um, a, a, it was, I think it was two years ago, they went with a uh, how to be successful at Harvard. This is Yale students came up with this. And keep in mind, they make fun of each other mercilessly with these t-shirts and in different ways. And they've done so for as long as there's been a game. Um, and how to be successful at Harvard, drop out. And it is, it is life. It's a Facebook life. Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Matt Z Damon, and 63 others. <laughs> Famous Harvard dropouts who did better for dropping out of Harvard. It's, a, it's, it's actually witty. <laughs> and this is the great. This is shows how sort of bureaucracies can take on a life of their own and, and actually work together, even even across rivalries. The Yale General Counsel intervened, said you cannot have this T-shirt without getting the permission of Harvard. <laughs> now, hopefully, I don't need to explain to you that that's forgive my expression bullshit. You don't need the permission of a of the person you're going to make fun of. Can I make fun of you? Can I make fun of your your, your Hallett Institution? <laughs> and making it even worse is when the students dutifully, and I think they, they should have never complied with this, but they, but they did. They actually went to the Harvard General Counsel's office and were told that they could not use the names Matt Damon, Mark Zuckerberg, and Bill Gates on their t-shirts. Which is incredible because it's more or less Harvard making a claim that they own those names. <laughs> which would be interesting for Matt Damon, Mark Zuckerberg, and uh, uh, Bill Gates to know that. Um, so they ended up having to, they ended up having a shirt like this, but they ended up having to censor uh, censor the T-shirt. And to me, it's just an interesting uh, um, uh, 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 example of sort of how, how mindless um, some of this uh, censorship can be, uh, can become. Now, what does this lead to? Now, people are probably going, "Oh my God, oh my God, uh, swastikas! What's going on?" <laughs> now, I, I'll explain. That's Sarah Palin with a, as Hitler. That's George Bush as Hitler. <laughs> and that's Barack Obama, I said. Everybody gets to be. And basically, and it's something that I, that I see is, is I feel like what we should be expecting right now as a country is that if higher education makes you a better, deeper thinker and a better arguer, we should, by all accounts, be living in a golden age of American discourse. 
I don't think anybody thinks that we live in a golden age of American discourse. I don't think anybody who watches TV thinks we live in a golden age of American discourse. And this is, I think, one of the great examples of, of how overheated our rhetoric sometimes has become, that we don't even know how to argue with each other without accusing someone else of being Hitler. Um, I, uh, John Stewart did a great piece on this, about, uh, um, and he, he talked about how people were lightly comparing each other to Hitler. And his argument was, and he, he, he said it's like, this is insulting to people who survived the Holocaust, this is insulting to the people who lived through World War II, and most of all, this is insulting to Hitler. <laughs> he did not work that hard to be that evil to just be compared to anybody you mildly disagree with. <laughs> so, and that's one thing that I always want to make people think about, is that we should really, it's not the question of whether or not things are, if our level of discourse is worse than it was in the 1980s, 1990s. In my life experience, actually, I think we are at a pretty low <coughs> ebb of the way we, we argue with each other. But that actually we should be expecting uh, things to be getting, uh, getting far, far better. And I think that there's lots of contributions to this. I think the, uh, and, it, and, I, and again, I don't think it's just campuses that's making this so polarized. Um, and I think there, there are lots of, uh, lots of harms and lots of bad lessons. Um, this is one of, uh, one of my you know, favorite bad lessons, which is a, uh, a, a professor at Northern Kentucky University. Um, and there was a pro-life display on campus. Um, I'm, I, I'm very much pro-choice. Um, but the idea that you're not allowed to actually have that opinion on campus is something that I run, that you're not allowed to be pro-life on campus is something I run into an awful lot. And this is a case where they, uh, you know, this was approved, this was, um, and they had a, a, a pro-life display that was um, little uh, crosses. It was a series of little crosses to, to protest Roe v. Wade. Um, uh, absolutely protected speech, public campus, this is not a hard question. Um, Sally Jacobson goes in front of her class um, and she says, I'm offended by that display, and I want you to exercise your First Amendment rights to go destroy that display. So she leads her students, they destroy, they, and she's, you know, smiling and happy, and they, and they destroy the, the student's property. But the thing that, that, that I find so striking about it was she wasn't just making something up. She wasn't just rationalizing it. Even asked, asked afterwards, she really believed that she had a First Amendment right to destroy someone else's expression. That is complete and total in inversion of what it means to live in a plural society or to understand freedom of speech. And here she was taking, uh, taking the, the, the heroic high ground and believing that she was actually fulfilling First Amendment rights when she was completely uh, perverting them. And I think that students are learning the lessons. Meanwhile, um, when students put up these things called free speech walls, these are white pieces of paper that they put on, uh, on campus. And it is a sociological experiment. It's to see what happens if you put a white piece of paper up, say you can write anything on it. Um, and the lesson that they're trying to uh, convey is that things actually don't go that badly. Um, the sky does not fall, and you're actually, for the most part, impressed by what people actually write. Now, they're 18 to 22 year olds, so they do tend to swear a lot. But other than that, there's a lot of wisdom on it, there's a lot of jokes. So one of the things that someone put, put on there was uh, the, the president of the university's salary. And when somebody does say something offensive, people circle it, um, they, they'll address it, they'll, they'll, they actually have an ongoing discussion on the free speech wall, and it works well. But nonetheless, students um, and faculty members tear these things down. And the scariest uh, representation of this that I've seen, and, and it's something that I see that's, I think, kind of, in some cases, uh, in, at least in the U.S., kind of unique to campuses, is that while most people in the U.S., um, you know, they, they know that they'll say they believe in free speech um, as a principle, but don't like particular aspects of it in practice, um, increasingly on campus, uh, I see that it's actually, they don't even like the theory of it. They think it's just a bad thing, it's a, re it's a regressive thing. And the best example I've seen of this was at a, uh, in response to a free speech wall in uh, Canada, at, at University of Toronto, where a student tore down the free speech wall not because he, defer, um, because he disagreed with anything that was actually written on it, but because he thought that it was a potential that something offensive could be written on it. And he wrote to the entire school saying, really, in a very self-congratulatory note, look what I've done for everybody and look how brave I am and I, and I do it again. And taking the moral high ground, again, against not the practice of what people say, but the very idea that people should be allowed to say, oh, say what they think. Going back to an idea that le left to our... Uh, our, our natural tendencies, it's all going to uh, uh, descend into a pit of, of hateful pandemonium, 
as uh, as opposed to you know enlightened uh, relying on enlightened censorship to, to 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 show us the one true way. So, changing the culture. As far as just sort of takeaway advice that I've been trying to that I think could make um, the culture on campus and the culture in the U.S. a lot better is once again is to make it a lifelong habit to seek out smart people with whom we disagree. Um, if we just did this, we'd be a lot more, le a lot less tedious of a, 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 a culture. Um, note the censorship instinct, the desire to grandstand, and the ease with which individuals claim offense. Um, I see. I, I certainly saw this in my time at Stanford. Um, it was very strange because the rules that meant if someone could claim that they were outraged, you had no. It, it was done. It was an ultimate trump card on arguments. And it's just human nature that if you create an ultimate trump card to arguments, people are going to use it way too often. And the, and the, lower, the, the level for what offends us uh, on campus in particular just gets lower and lower and lower. Um, and ask yourself if you're uh, reducing people with whom you disagree to quote unquote character in the side of evil. I see this problem on campuses all the time where someone says something that someone doesn't like and it's no longer a debate, it's, it's um, uh, that someone gets uh, presented as a representation of societal evil and their humanity gets pretty much forgotten. And remember that arguments that make us the most uncomfortable are often the ones we most badly need to have. Um, that is true time and time again. I, I've seen people talk about um, defend censorship and when you ask them really what they would like to um, uh, cut down on, it seems that, that, you, that, that really what they're talking about is, I, you know, I believe in free speech and all, just don't talk about anything important. <laughs> so here's your homework. Um, you read the book, uh, but you already, uh, most of you already have. I brought two uh, copies of it. I'm happy to, uh, to those of you who haven't and who promised to read it, I'd be happy to give you a copy. Yeah, give you a copy. Um, and uh, join Fire Student Network. You can get a, a Fire t-shirt if you do. Um, they're, they're not half bad. Um, and check out uh, your school's policy at thefire.org. Um, and uh, because, you know, as I, as I say, you don't have to, uh, you know, accept campus censorship as the new normal. And in close, I've always liked this quote, um, which gets to sort of the epistemology and philosophy behind freedom of speech. Um, it's a learned hand speech, 1944. The spirit of liberty is a spirit which is not too sure that it is right. Um, it, uh, I know I'm not omniscient. I suspect none of you are either. Um, and if that's the case, then you always have to uh, recognize that wisdom can come from surprising places, from for, for surprising provocations. Um, and that you have to be open to the idea of this weird anarchical system um, and the, uh, the, the wisdom and knowledge it can actually generate. So uh, that's my speech. Uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to take questions. <laughs>